Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this February installment of the United States Patent and Trademark Office's monthly Office of Education K-12 webinar. My name is Juan Valentin. I'm an education advisor in the education in the Office of Education and Outreach. And I've been on this team for about eight years. And formerly, I was a patent examiner for 12 years. And so um, it comes with great joy that we are here tonight talking to you. I'm about to present to you a little information about the conception and the um, the origins of Equip HQ Educator Portal. And with, with us tonight, we have our guest speaker, David Youngblunt, a Director of Learning Design at Second Avenue Learning. This project was in a contracted effort together um, between the USPTO and Second Avenue. And we're excited to, to really jump in. So before I start, I want to go ahead and give David uh, a couple seconds to introduce himself, and then I'll jump right in. Sure. Good evening. Um, it's really nice to be here. Thanks, Juan, for having me. I've um, been working on this project for a while and really enjoyed working together with all the different individuals involved. Um, folks from the USPTO, we've gotten to know each other quite a bit um, as we've built the best website we can. Uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I have um, I've been 25 years in the classroom before working at Second Avenue Learning, and so I, uh, I bring that lens with me uh, into this work. And thank you again, Juan, for having me. Yeah, for sure. And I think after today's conversation, it's going to become very apparent the different skill sets that were needed to create um, this resource and with the ability to connect with a, a variety of different audiences at different age ranges. So with that, we can move into the next slide. Before we um, go over anything, I'd like to just play a, a short video that really is going to introduce you to to the site, and um, and then we'll we'll jump into the conversation. Get to know Equip HQ. Equip HQ from the United States Patent and Trademark Office is built to teach important concepts about intellectual property or IP and to encourage young people to participate in the culture of innovation by recognizing the value of putting ideas into action. Equip HQ offers free, standards aligned lesson plans that are designed to introduce invention education and intellectual property concepts to K 12 students. Teachers can use the site to find structured activities for their classrooms, or students can explore and complete activities on their own. Simulations of IP processes present learners with play-based learning, and our Inventor Story video series introduces learners to both young and adult inventors who share their stories, ideas, and the lessons they have learned from inventing. All lesson plans and activities can be filtered by grade level and are crafted to inspire student choice. The Mission Equip Learning Path guides students of all ages through the study of intellectual property. Some activities ask students to identify real life challenges that are meaningful to them. Learners are then prompted to use their ingenuity to design new products and services that can help solve these problems. With Equip HQ, students learn that ideas don't have to be world changing to be useful. Invention is inclusive and everyone can do it. Even small changes that make products or experiences a little bit better can have a big impact. So as you can tell from the video, the, the, the education portal has a little bit of everything. And so we're excited to, to jump right in. But as you saw on that slide, the next slide, tell us a little bit about yourself, please. We are curious to know who's dialing in from where, um, I would say around the United States, but we are worldwide now in the virtual world. So please let us know where you're coming from. Um, do you have a role in education or or what, what your role is and, and what um, do you hope to learn from this webinar? Use it, write it in the chat for us. We would love to learn a little bit about some of the the people in the room listening today. And this is going to have some Q&A opportunities for you. So please do have those questions ready. Um, so once again, tell us where you're joining from, what your role in education is, and, and what you hope to learn from this, this webinar. And you can do that in the chat anytime throughout this presentation. Uh, David, if we can move to the next slide. So we're going to um, have a Padlet today for you. So if you have an, a, uh, we're going to put the link in the chat. So if you don't have a phone, 
don't don't worry. But if you do have a phone, you feel free to use the QR code. We want to we want to use this Padlet as a collection point for your thoughts throughout the presentation. If while we're talking, something comes to mind. Of course, you can use the chat, but we would love to capture those thoughts in this Padlet and feel free to comment on other people's comments. Um, and so we can keep a conversational thread going um, through the webinar, but even beyond this webinar. Right. And so this Padlet will live for a little while after the webinar. And we would love to hear some of your thoughts um, and, and comments on, on the website. Right. Your your opinion matters. And we are really, really curious to know some of the thoughts that um are elicited as you as you hear this conversation between David and I tonight. And so there's the Padlet. The link is going to be in the chat. Um, Lennon put it in there. And so with that, we'll give up a few more seconds for people to use that QR code if you're trying to get your phone up. And you know what? Let me click on that link as well. Let me pull it up. Cool. All right. Next slide. So as we dive into the whys of Equip HQ, we want to first start with the purpose of the site, what students will get after engaging with Equip HQ, right? They're going to be able to recognize and see possibilities for themselves and their ideas that maybe they didn't have before playing around in Equip HQ and um, interacting with some of the activities. They're going to develop an understanding of intellectual property, IP for short, uh, IP concepts, and literacy. They're going to have an ability to demonstrate uh, the ability to make creative choices, um, develop skills to participate in the culture of innovation, as well as identify and learn about inventors from a diversity of backgrounds. And lastly, they'll be able to use knowledge and skills gained to improve life within their own communities. It goes beyond this slide. However, I think these are the overarching um, objectives and goals that, that students will, will get from interacting with Equip HQ and the, and the multitude of resources that can be found on this educator portal. And as you know, now, for those, for those yeah, teachers in the room, as you know, one of these skills feeds the other. Each one is uh, so sort of, it's like a cycle, a recursive cycle. We want one, as one's happening, the other one's happening too, and one follows upon the other. Absolutely. It's not one or the other. It's kind of they build upon each other. And All so right. to make this website happen, we took a team approach. Um, we had a team consisting of educational software designers, IP professionals, educators, and people who straddle those positions, plus more. But it makes a neat Venn diagram to look at these three. These are our major groupings. It really does. And it, it's when we... When we sat down in the beginning of this project and we were conceptualizing what it was going to be like, it really, you know, when you hear intellectual property and kindergarten, second grade, even middle school, right? You just think, wow, that's a complex subject matter to tackle with with youngest um, our youngest learners. And so you, we really, you know, we've been doing this a long time. You know, our Office of Education has been around. I'm not sure how many years, but I've been here eight years. And um each it's it's hard right because we're kind of carving out our own little niche um intellectual property a k-12 education really hasn't existed at a um a robust level and so we're trying to create an opportunity to reach those communities that we can't physically reach ourselves our team is small right we we have less than 10 people on our team and it's hard for us to reach all of the communities that need this essential um, educational information. And so this website, this portal gives us the ability to reach the far corners of the United States and frankly the world and provide an opportunity for everyone to learn about invention and innovation and how to be creative and problem solvers um, and world savers. And so how do you do that, right? And so. First, it starts here with these three main pillars, and, and David's going to go ahead and talk to us from, from the Second Avenue side, and I'm going to go ahead and mute you, Alice, if you don't mind. Um, there you go. Thank you. And so, what, David, go ahead and tell us about you know the educational software designer and educa educator perspective from Second Avenue's perspective. Sure. So learning design is um, for us the conjunction of, of the work of many different disciplines. Um, 
we begin with learning objectives. Uh, we want to make sure that the website activities and lesson plans and such are all pedagogically sound and that they're delivered through a developmental lens. You'll see when we get to the website that we have grade bands, age bands, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and 9, 12. So we want to make sure that we're meeting kids where they are. Um, why don't we want the content to be understandable yet challenging? Uh, we want to see concept and skill development. There was quite a lot of um, thoughtfulness that went into the design and the uh, delivery of the website. We also have a, a team of educational software designers, and I'm very happy to work with them. Um, user interface and user experience experts, uh, people who work in game mechanics, coders, um, content authors, <laughs> lesson plan writers, subject matter expertise. We've, we've spoken to people outside both of our organizations to learn even more and to uh, help bring more information to you uh, than even we hold ourselves and artists as well. Um, you'll see actually the color palette right here on this slide um, came from our team of artists as well as well as um, this really nifty morphing effect. So we return to uh, the path and the next slide is about the intersection of educational software designer skill sets and IP professionals. And, and so from this side, given that we are the United States Patent and Trademark Office, we obviously have that lens for intellectual property. But on our team, we also have a, a wealth of knowledge from, from educators within the classroom experience, um, dozens of years of experience in the classroom. And so we have that dual lens of look. And so we had these visions in our head of, of what this type of educational resource could look like, but we didn't have the means to build it on our, our end, right? We didn't have that technical know-how to create these interactive games. And so it was it was really a fun opportunity to be able to kind of throw these ideas on a wall and say, hey, how can we teach this concept, this high-level concept about invention and about patenting to a eight-year-old, to a 10-year-old? And, and how are they gonna understand it? So really breaking down into key conceptual just kind of pillars and then identifying which ones you want to pull out and focus on for a particular activity, right? You can't do it all in one. So we just kind of each activity kind of hones in and, and focuses on a particular skill or two and develops that. And then we kind of scaffold and add on to it after that. But it's really important to have that intellectual property um, subject matter expert to really frame the content in a, in a way that is true to intellectual property that doesn't lose the the true essence of what IP is and how it is used um, to help build economies, to help grow um, communities. And so that was fun to, to marry with the educational software design aspect where, okay, well, yes, you know, well, I'll let David speak to, to, to how Second Avenue worked with, with our team, but um, it was fun. So, uh, you know, I'll stop there. It was fun. And those shared understandings are important. We we had to start with shared understandings of our own before we could get to the shared understandings we would uh, we bring to the kids who come and visit the site and the teachers. I, I really hope you uh, the teachers enjoy uh, what you find on the site as well. It's been this has been an eye opening experience for me. I've really, really enjoyed working together and learning as much as I've learned about IP. So I think the, the most critical part of this whole project was the ability to distill the, the complex content down into bite-sized manageable pieces that our youngest learners are able to not only interact with, but um, retain that knowledge uh, that, that they've played with on, on our site and acquired on our site. And so plain language is crucial. Uh, there's a there's a government mandate for all public facing documents to, to be in plain language. And so of course that was our are, are one of our major drivers, but at the same time, beyond the, the policy of plain language, it, it's about being able to understand and being able to take away um, shared experiences on the site and, and have those conversations in the classroom or in, at your home with your parents about the different activities, what you learned, um, how it can be applied to your life, their life, right? It's not just make-believe. This is real life. These are real life skills that these students are going to be acquiring by interacting with um, Equip HQ. And so it was really, really important to get the language right. And we think we've done a good job, but we are 
We are all about um, quality control. So as you drive around the site and you play with it, please, you know, send us our, your feedback, um, education at uspto.gov. And we'll drop that in the chat for you. But we would love to hear um, if you, you've used it in your classroom. We want to hear stories. Please tell us stories and, and lived experiences. Those are those are the best. I think that website's on the last slide, too. So if you don't catch it this time, it'll be it'll come back around. So that was our path. And now for a little more detail, and we ended up here with Equip HQ, all these um, all these professions coming together. Um, in the middle, we end up with something transdisciplinary when two or more discipline perspectives transcend each other. And that's what we were aiming for all along that we could use our shared expertise, our shared professionalism to create something that could bring children into, hopefully uh, for many, a new world, um, a new world of possibilities. We, you know, we, we, we included um, history, reading, writing, vocabulary, engineering design, um, visual representation, visual interpretation, along with uh, 21st century skills like teamwork, um, problem solving, working together, perseverance. And we wanted to bring a real holistic approach to our students who come to visit the site. Um, and hopefully, you know, um, when we show it to you soon, hopefully we'll give you a, a piece of that. And this is really, I think the, um, this is this is great. This, the ability to bring multiple subject matters together in learning is I think the icing on the cake in terms of invention education. That is, one of the major factors that makes I think invention education probably in the in the future I don't know how far down the line um, but it's going to be important to all in, in all educational I, I feel like um, curriculums it, the, the fact that invention can bring together all of these different subject matters into one cohesive learning experience uh, you know project-based learning is similar there's there's actually project-based learning on on Equip HQ um invention involves empathy right and and looking out for others and how can i improve the lives of others and, and so i just i love the fact that you can get english you can get sem the science technology engineering and math from from this website you can get history content from this website and it's they're not just one-offs these are all things that come together in a multitude of different ways as you interact with the site and, and you're gonna you're gonna see that this is not just for one subject but it is in, indeed for all subjects intellectual property is everywhere so on the site there are some lesson plans available we have some uh, small units we've put together using the five E's structure and uh, there we start with um, all of our work uh, that we do with lesson planning is research based. We have a number of um, I'm, I'm not the only um, teacher on the uh, on the job here. We have several teachers. We have some here with us even tonight uh, from the USPTO as well. And so we we work hard to make sure that these lesson plans are engaging, interesting and experiential and that they often link into the the, the uh, activities that we have on the site as well. So they give we use those activities to create the experiences that really can reach the learner. Uh, we made the lesson plans to be self-contained, meaning you can do everything within Equip HQ. You don't have to go anywhere else, but you can. You can go and reach out to other places. You'll actually see again later when we visit the website that there are many links that will take you to other uh, information sites and primary sources and all kinds of good stuff like that. Supplemental materials also come along with the lesson plans. They include reference guides. This one in particular, the types of intellectual property reference guide. Um, this might be one that you'd like to peruse um, before getting started with um, many of the lesson plans because it holds some vital information about intellectual property. Copyrights, patents, trademarks, trade secrets, what are they exactly? Activity worksheets, these are these go side by side, hand in hand with the lesson plans. Rubrics, we have rubrics both for teacher scoring of student work and for peers to score the cooperative work they do with their classmates. Or if you're a homeschooler with possibly with a sibling or a friend. Assessments, uh, we also have some assessments available. If you're interested, they can be used as for quizzing, testing. They can also be used if you wish, just as an assignment. 
I, I, I want to um, spend a little little time talking about the supplemental material. So that was really important um, for us to include support materials for educators because we realize it's it's hard to bring new content into your classroom, especially new content that you are really not familiar with and might be a little um, scary or nerve wracking to kind of tackle on your own. And so we really wanted to provide those support materials, the, the reference guides, the glossary of terms, the videos to help help build up your um, comfort level with the subject matter before bringing it into your classroom. And so I just wanted that message to be, to, to resonate with everybody. We are here for you. You know, the USPTO, our office of education, we are an email away um, and we can answer questions. We can help you integrate this into an activity or a, a classroom project that you're trying to do. So please, as you go through these materials, if you have a question, do not hesitate to reach out to us, please. So this next table is our, I've labeled it developmental progression. Um, it's really our curriculum planning guide. It's uh, the concepts and skills that we wanted to teach at each age level. It's a, This is our vertical alignment here. This is where we can see how one concept feeds into the next and the next and the next. And this, um, this was an important structure for us as we decided how we would teach each age level. We have acti activities that are appropriate for K-2 students and we have activities that are appropriate for uh, 12th graders, 9th to 12th, and in between as well. So we want to make sure that um, every age level, that every school age, age level that visits is served. And uh, actually, frankly, um, anyone can join in. It doesn't just have to be kids in school or in a grade level. I'll give you just a moment to look through the chart if you like. And so I, I will um, I will say that this is a draft chart, but we we wanted to share it with you just to give you an idea of the the thought process in the progression of the content that we as we build out these activities for age appropriate levels the kind of things that we're looking at and this eventually will be available on on the site so with that we want to open it up real quick to a q a before we jump into an actual walkthrough of the site itself um, we've gotten through the theory, we've gotten through the why, um, why we think it's important, what it's going to do for your learners. Um, any thoughts? Questions? All right. Well, Reggie. So I know a lot of K-12 K through 12 educators uh, may be curious um, about how exactly to implement this in their classrooms. Um, you talked about lesson plans. Uh, you talked about ways that we could uh, use this with our students. Um, do we have any feedback from students who have used this before? You all have play tested before. Uh, or any personal stories or anything you could share uh, about students actually doing this in this classroom? That's a great question. Um, I, I know we do. We So through the development of this site, we wanted to make sure that before we gave a product that was public facing, we wanted to make sure that it actually had value and that students enjoyed learning, right? Because we want learning to be fun. And so, that I think was the the best part of this project is taking intellectual property and making it fun on at a level for kids that's accessible. And so um, we did lots of extensive play testing with different age groups. Um, one group in particular, high schoolers, a group of high school students that we are lucky enough to have as part of our work-based learning cohort here at the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Um, we have a high school um, work work-based learners that are um, on site with us Monday through Thursday for a few hours every day. And they play tested some of our more advanced. Actually, I think they play tested a lot of the activities, but most recently they play tested some of the more advanced um, activities that you'll see on the site uh, called Patent Sensei and Patent Quest. And those really hone in on patent examining functions and really understanding what claim language is and 
I'm not going to go into detail about what claim language is right now, but I, it's on the website. You can patent quest. will I'll, I'll go ahead and, and give you a good brief around what, what a patent claim is. Shameless plug for the site. But um, it was interesting, the comments that the, the students had there, you know, because they grew up in this technical age. Right. And so they they grew up with um, technology in the palms of their hands. And so the insight that we got from these students was incredible. It was incredibly valuable um, in terms of this is too much reading. Um, I really wish that this button did this or when you clicked on this, I wanted to receive this type of information, but I didn't. And I was I was left wanting for more. And so it was it was awesome to read those types of comments and, and really did help us develop the activity even further. David, I don't know if you have any any stories or not. Um, not as many as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I got one more uh, real quick. So my daughter, she's 11 and um, she's in sixth grade. And I, I asked her to play test um, the the the, high, the six middle school activities and high school activities. And it was a Friday evening after school, probably about 5 p.m. She started and I didn't expect much. I was just, you know, especially from your own child, um, you know, she's like, whatever, dad. Um, but I'm not lying. Like four or five hours later, she's still playing with these activities. I couldn't believe it. I was just mind blown. And, and it actually was one of the best conversations I've had with her in a while, just talking about the site and what was cool, what she didn't really get about it. And it was, it was, it was really fascinating. So, um, yeah. yeah. I think with that, I don't see any more questions. Are you testing the material out with actual learners? Yes, we are. And we did. Um, any other questions, Lennon, that we missed? No, I think we're good. Okay. All right, David, let's jump in. Let's go. Right. Let's take a dive. Here we go to the website. So here's the look at the main page. And over we go. So here we are in Equip HQ. You may have been here before. This might be your first visit. We're going to go today on a little tour through these grade bands. We'll start off with K2 and visit a young friend of ours. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna um, watch a, a not the whole video, but we're gonna watch about a minute or so of one a video highlight of one of our young inventors highlighted on Equip HQ, Solomon Deskins. And so, one of the aspects about this this project that I really um, like is the fact that it there's representation on this site. It doesn't matter what learner comes and and plays around with this site. You know, hopefully they're going to find a representation, someone who looks like them or someone who might be a community that they grew up in. And they're going to they're going to be able to see that and it's going to be able to to inspire them to say, hey, wow, like th there's a website displaying, you know, all this different variety of of inventors. And that could be me one day. And I just absolutely love that about Equip HQ. And so we're just going to play a little bit of uh, Solomon's video here. Um, yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> I'm Solomon Deskins. I'm eight years old and I'm in third grade. Inventors use all kinds of tools, including computer science. Solomon enjoys building websites and apps using his computer. He started by using block coding. Block coding is when a programmer tells a computer what to do by connecting blocks. Each block is a command. For example, a print block tells the computer to put text on a page or screen. Next, Solomon wanted to learn how to do text coding. In text coding, a person types commands using the keyboard. After he learned text coding by himself, Solomon decided to make a game that would teach other kids how to code with text. Can you tell us how your game started and what it turned into? Warrior code teaches real coding languages for ages 6 to 14 years old. I was really thinking about how would I ki keep kids motivated how to do it and how I created the how I will create the app. And to keep kids motivated, we have collectibles. You can finish levels to build real toys. 
and the box includes a free download and materials to build toys. So that's Solomon. He's a dynamic young man, and he's had quite an experience as a young inventor. Um, it was uh, really neat to have him share that with us and uh, and to put this video out to the world. Each of these videos features a bit of a it's a, it's like a greeting, um, an invitation to into this person's world, a little bit about them to get started, and then uh, what they did, what their what their accomplishment was with IP, big or small, and then their thoughts about it. What's what's your advice to other invent inventors at the end? So we're going for that uh, that excitement, that stimulation to go try it too. And the next grade band is three to five. Now on the site, um, other than the um, you have the videos, we also have several activities available. And one of them that I'm looking for in here, I think I just actually went past it, is called the Match Game. Match Game I, is I, a... I think some people have already been playing it, David. <laughs> <laughs> <They've been, laughs> Throw it in the chat if you've been playing with it. So we're going to play a little game here and try to make one match tonight. Oh, come on. So while David is um, trying to strike gold, finding a match, which is much harder than than it actually is, looks these this matching game is is a ten year anniversary kind of celebration of our United States Patent and Trademark Office inventor trading cards, and so it's a series of trading cards that highlight inventors who have created um, inventions that affect everyday life that we use on a day to day basis, but may not realize that this came from somewhere from somebody and we're trying to promote invention from once again a diversity of communities so if you look at our our the range of inventors across our inventor trading cards you'll see representation across many different backgrounds and um we it's, it's we love these cards and this game is a fun way to teach people about them and i think david you found a match congratulations Who the pressure Cooper. was on so we found Rory Cooper, and he's an inventor. He works uh, in in Pittsburgh, and he has made many um, adaptive. He's made uh, things like adaptable wheelchairs. He's made the better mouse. Um, he made that for a soldier who lost both hands and and wanted to mouse on his computer. And uh, Rory's done a lot of great work, and he's actually one of our interviewees on the videos. This is a link. If you click on his learn the learn more under his card, you can get to this, which is more information about. Dr. Cooper. And then if you go to the breadcrumbs at the top here, you can go see all the inventor cards available through the USPTO. Oh, one, um, should we talk about the the uh, how to get these to these cards or get these cards? So Lennon put a link in the chat, um, but if you go to our kids and educators page, there's a link to the inventor trading cards from that page as well. Uh, and and oh, real quick, I, I, I do want to highlight, if you go back to that card matching page, sure. I think the hardest part about Equip HQ was how do we bring it back to intellectual property, right? We are the United States Patent and Trademark Office. How do we work? Everything we did, and David is probably smiling because pretty much during every meeting, uh, me or someone on my team are like, that's awesome. How do we bring it back to intellectual property? Like, where's the tie-in? Like, how do we do it? And so I love the fact that this particular game, you see the patent. Now, kids are going to be playing this. They're probably not going to, the, the youngest learners may not know what that is. However, a curious mind may click on that link. And when they click on that link, they're going to get exposed to a United States patent, an actual patent, an actual invention from that inventor on the trading card. They may just look at drawings to begin with. Maybe someone's curious and they start, you know, read the abstract. Or they read a little bit about it. And this is their introduction to, to patents, right? And maybe that curiosity grows through time. Um, but this is great. Everything we do, it, it comes with where's the hook? Like, how do we bring them into IP? Um, and so here you have it. And there's, a, there's a patent. One of the greatest, one of the things that I like the most about this is that what they're seeing is an actual patent. It's it, it's what um, Dr. Cooper had to file. This is his patent application, which was accepted. It has drawings inside. It has labels inside. It has patent. It has dates for reference. It has locations, and it has the description, which is not like typical language that kids are going to see. But if they dive in, you know, whenever they go in, I think they're going to come out with something new. 
Exactly. So that that can be found in our three, five, and up um, grade bands. That particular activity. Speaking of up, here we go to six to eight. And now we're looking for the timeline. So all your activities are down here. Uh, there's the timeline. It's on the front page for me. That's a lucky, lucky shot there. So the timeline begins, the importance of this date again, Juan, is 1790. 1790 is the start, uh, well, it's the Constitution, correct? And in the Constitution, there's a clause, I believe it's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. It's the Intellectual Property Clause, and I don't have it memorized, I should. But um, basically, <laughs> it's... Pretty good. <laughs> Basically, it it protects inventors' works and their creations um, for invention and and um, copyright artists. And so that was the that was the beginning, the seed you would say for um, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, which was officially established a few late, a few years down the road. Um, but so our timeline does start from 1790 to present. I'm going to take you on a quick tour through the timeline and try to visit various types of intellectual property. First one is the steamboat. This is a patent. You can see by the symbol in the in the corner that's meant to represent a patent. If you want to learn more, you'll see a, um, a primary source over here. This is from uh, USPTO's records, and I believe Library of Congress holds these as well. And this uh, particular um, this particular invention was an NIHF National Inventors Hall of Fame inductee. If you click on that, you end up with even more information. You can go find out about John Fitch, the inventor, what he invented, when he invented it, and a little bit of a story that goes along with it. So there are many external links that you can go follow to learn more and do research through the website. And then we'll slide up to 1869. So I'll grab the slider here, head for 1869. And so this timeline is thematic. So for the first year of the project, the, all the intellectual property associated on this timeline is going to deal with transportation themes. Um, this year, our second year, we are focused on communications theme for the timeline. Um, and then another thing you're going to find on here are, are our inventor trading card, inventor bios. And then there's going to be some in-depth inventor bios that I think David might talk about one um, coming up. So I'm not going to ruin it. Sounds good. So here, here's an example of copyright. This is a photo, we, the famous photo, the last spike. This is, uh, it tells who the photographer was when it was shot and what this photograph meant to the people who viewed it. And then we'll move along to 1947. We're going to go visit Temple Grandin. Temple Grandin is also a National Inventors Hall of Fame inductee. And here is, this is uh, the, the trading card for USPTO, and that's one of the set. And here's some information about her. And then our final visit, this one will be a trademark, and this one will be in 1988, just to show you the breadth of the timeline, or a good piece of the breadth of the timeline. 1988, shape and design of the Chevron sign. At being a trademark. And so examples are are here for all different types of IP and from all different times. And also information like the registration number, which doesn't seem terribly interesting until you start to understand what a registration number is and how if you use that number, you can go find the, uh, the actual um, paperwork for this and learn more about it. So as you can see, there's so many different directions you can go with this interactive timeline in your classroom. Also, David, I'm not sure if you mentioned, but you can actually copy the URL to a specific entry on that on that timeline, and you can share that with your students and say, hey, go to this entry on the time, go to this link and, you know, write a short paragraph about this particular, you know, entry or, you know, however you want to frame that project. So you don't have to just send them cold to this timeline. You can send them to a specific point on that timeline. Um, we have, uh, there's, it's filterable, so you can filter it by the type of IP. Um, once there's multiple themes on here, you'll be able to also filter by theme. And so it really is a, um, a, a great resource to have. And it's and terrific that. for kicking kids off to research, getting them interested, letting them do a hunt, 
or just to, just to look and find? What did you find today? What's in there? What's new to you? What's interesting to you and why? And so now the final grade band is a nine to 12 group. This is, this is, I think, my favorite, um, right now at least, it changes daily, but for now I think the 9 to 12 is, is, is where I hang out the most these days in, in these Patent Quest, Patent Sensei, the prototype zone is pretty cool. We're going to talk about Patent Quest today, um, and Patent Quest is an activity that puts you in the shoes of a patent examiner. I'm sorry, no, it does not put you in the shoes of an examiner, it puts you in the shoes of an inventor who's trying to file a patent application. And so this activity walks you through the intricacies and in all the different nuances, not all of them, but a lot of the different nuances that people filing a patent application are going to need to think about. And, and if you want to bring your product to market, it even goes into a little of entrepreneurial education as well. And so first things first, when you get to these introduction pages for these activities, you're going to notice a, a brief intro. And then on the right here, you see the little play button, get to know patent quest. That's an intro video. Each activity comes with an introductory video that gives a little um, briefer, a little background explanation. It might go into some glossary terms, explain maybe what a patent is or what a trademark is. Uh, and, and then it goes and walks you through the actual activity itself, a quick walkthrough. And so if we go into Patent Quest, you can pick a different invention. We're going to pick, uh, David, what are, you, what are you picking today? So a hands-free jet-powered scuba suit. Ooh, that sounds fun. All right, let's go scuba diving. And so beginning, what you're going to see here is you're going to see on the, on the left hand, you're going to see your application. You're going to see your support. That's where you go to get support. And if you, if you click on, on the right-hand side, you'll see that that's kind of a log, a list of all the different things you've done through the activity in your activity log. You see money. So there's, there's money. You have a budget. So there's a financial aspect to this activity. You have to track how much money you're spending. There's also a time, a day's passed. So you see that the clock is ticking with every move you make, you expend a certain amount of time. And so depending on how you frame this activity, you know, you can have a certain budget limit. You can have a certain time frame limit if you'd like. You can't set that specifically within the app, but um, maybe that's a future upgrade. I don't know. <laughs> Um, but when you go in, you see you can self-fund, which means that you're doing it all on your own. You know, you're rolling up your sleeves. You're going to go shovel snow. You're going to rake leaves. You're going to earn your own money. You're going to deliver newspapers. I don't know how you're going to get that money. Or it talks about bank loans and there's interest rates. So you can teach about um, interest and, and how that works. There's investors, right? Um, VCs, venture capitalists. You can crowdfund, you know, like... Uh, uh, GoFundMe and those types of things. Um, go to market, and then finally you can go to market, right? And going to market is going to cost you some money, so you're going to have to you're going to have to get some money before you could actually go to market. In terms of your application, um, so you're gonna you can take a certificate training course. You you can search for patents. You can hire somebody to search for patents, or you can do it on your own. You can um, set the claims. So this is kind of the main part of the activity here. This is really what this activity centers around. And it's when you when you have a patent application, at the end of the, the patent application, there's this set this section called claims. Patent claims are the words that describe what your invention is, the main components and the limitations that your invention is, is made up of. So if I right now I'm sitting in a chair, right? And so I have a I have a, a seat, I'll call it a flat surface, connected with a, um, at 90 degrees with another flat surface, right? And so, and then I, I have a pole in the middle of the bottom flat surface that runs to the floor, right? And so I'm just describing my invention, right? It's a terrible description. Um, I, I'm not going to use this claim in real life. But basically what you're doing when you file claims is you're trying to get that language passed through the patent examiner to receive a patent. And what that patent examiner is going to do is going to read your claim language and they're going to go search for it. And so if they find your claim language, they're going to send a rejection. And so the more narrow you create, the, the more specific you craft your claim, essentially it's going to be harder for that patent examiner to find that limitation because it's really narrow. But it, you, if you claim it broadly, then it's going to be easier for the patent examiner to claim because it's so broad that many different things could be used to reject that limitation. Um, so patent claims are like house deeds. 
So if you're a property owner, you you own a house, it comes with a deed. In that deed, there's a circle, right? Or, a, or not a circle, but there's a there's a line around your property. Everything inside that line you own. That's your deed. Well, the claim basically is the fence around your property. So that claim language is drawing a fence around your invention and everything inside is your is is your going to be your property so a patent issue so that's what this activity is all about and there's a lot that goes into it there is so much that goes into this but they get to play around with the different claim language they get to find lawyers or they could hire if they can't afford a lawyer they can hire patent agents they can hire searchers um, someone to help search they can apply for pro bono services so this activity really teaches about uh, many of the different nuances and resources available to someone who is filing for a patent application. There's a lot here. It's it's a good one. It's um it's it's intense, but it's cool. It's fun. And this is the activity that my daughter spent like over three hours on. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot there. So the next area that we'll go visit is the teacher and family resource area. I'd like to I'd like you to see that it appears on each activity screen in the corner. This is for teachers and family um, members. Uh, maybe uh, you might homeschool or you might just want to do this with your child. Uh, you can go over here and you can get to our lesson plans, our supplemental materials, our assessments, rubrics, etc. I'm going to go through another path to get there. There's more than one way and that's back to the home screen where we have a teachers and family toolbox right here. Each activity comes with lesson plans and this one in particular, I'd like to look up in the nine to 12 area and take you to one of our PBL lessons, our project-based learning lessons. Here's the teacher and family guide for project-based learning. It's quite lengthy. There are, there are a number of activities contained within because it's actually in six parts the project-based learning it involves brain you, kids will students learn about brainstorming they do a brainstorming activity they learn about research and they do a research activity collaboration they do a, an activity around that planning a solution initial drawings for your idea and prototyping and there is a person who we have explaining this at the beginning of each lesson her name is lucy howell and she works at the Henry Ford Museum. I'd like to show you one of her, just the beginning of one of her videos that introduces the prototyping lesson, the prototyping, I should say, PBL lesson. We've actually got the various stages of the original development of the Aeron chair. So as well as the designs um, of that chair, we've also got each of the kind of prototype stages that the designers went through. And when you get an opportunity to see them one after the other, you can really see the importance of prototyping in that because it's this really beautiful blend of design and shape with practicality. You know, the idea of the chair is to be the most comfortable chair that you can sit on. And you can actually see that play out through the prototypes in that part of the collection. And then they're off to the PBL activity with teacher support through the lesson plan. And so and, and what you noticed in that video, you saw drawings, you saw patent drawings. And so there's a connection to intellectual property there. And each of these videos, they can you can you don't have to do all six at the same time, right? It just all depends where you are in your classroom. If you want to, if you want to start with prototyping, you can start with prototyping. You can jump down to that section of the PBL. Um, however, if you do have the time, the natural the progression would be to go through brainstorming, research, collaboration, planning a solution, drawings, and prototyping. But all those videos are super short. I don't think there's one that's longer than two minutes. Um, most of them are, are a minute and a half or, or a minute in length. And so. Um, it's, I just I think it's a really, really great um, lesson uh, or PBL to, to bring into the classroom. And the same for lesson plans too, right, David? The lesson plans are they're broken up into different activities as well. So you really don't have to start at the beginning. You can jump to a different section if, if that's all you have time for in your classroom. And if you want to make one of the activities make sense, you can just use that lesson plan as a guide to get you in. It's uh, I, I found uh, 
writing the lesson plans was very helpful to me for understanding IP. And so with that being said, we have come to the conclusion of our program today. We are going to stay on for Q&A, so please do, if you have questions, do not leave just yet. But I did want to introduce our guest speaker, not introduce today, but just introduce the slide um, for our guest speaker for next month's K-12 Educator Webinar. And that's going to be Miss Lucy Howell uh, from the Henry Ford Museum. And so she's going to be on March 28th, same time, same place. And so we are really looking forward to hearing from Lucy next month, but we definitely wanted to give her a plug and, and let you know that this PBL resource is on Equip HQ right now for everybody to, to um, access. And so with that, I think we will take some questions. Please ask away. And also don't forget about the Padlet. I do thank you to those who comment on the Padlet. I see the few comments on there. Don't forget about that. Thoughts? Questions? Oh, we have questions. Okay, Lennon. How about you? I'm gonna. Um, can you jump on and hit us with some questions? So we got some questions that were asked during your presentation. First one is: Can inventors use it? Those who can't afford attorneys. Um, so one of the ideas of the activity, the game, was to um, give students the experience of what it can be like and the decisions you have to make. There is a the option. I think. Um, Juan was saying you can you can deliver newspapers, you can shovel driveways, you can fund yourself, or you can do a crowdfunding where you set an amount that you'd like to achieve, and then you wait for that amount to arrive. And when you've uh, when you have that, then you can go to work with that money. But the game is also accomplishable without any outside support. It can be done. It's difficult, but it can be done. And I. I I will answer that term. So David went the Equip HQ route. I'm going to go the real life route. And definitely you can get, um, file a patent application without the support of an attorney. It's it's not, obviously it's not going to be as, um, it's going to be more time consuming, a lot more time consuming. There's plenty of resources. If you go to our website, www.uspto.gov, there's learning and resources section on our website that has a lot of information. It's going to take you a little while to sift through, but it's there's quality information on our website. There's so many um, information. In fact, we've just recently revamped our website to make it more um, approachable, more accessible to um, pro se applicants. Pro se applicants would be uh, people who are not using an attorney to file a patent application. Um, but once again, I don't want to I don't want to sugarcoat it and make it make make it seem like it's going to be an easy process because that would be doing an injustice. It, it, it's going to take some work, but it, it's done all the time. It, it is done. So it's possible for sure. Next question is, to what extent will this website track or correlate with events.org or NIHF? It seems that more educators are familiar with that site. Yeah, so NIF is the National Inventors Hall of Fame, and they are um, they are a nonprofit educational organization that the USPTO actually helped found. So they've been around for a long time, and they have a lot of amazing resources for promoting innovation and outreach to young inventors and inspiring the next generation of, in, of innovators, just like we are doing here in the Office of Education. So this is different from NIF. This is directly from the USPTO. However, they're both um, they're both useful and quality quality um, resources for our youngest learners. Next question: Are all of these resources free and available to the public? These res these resources are free ninety nine. They are absolutely free to everybody. <laughs> That's the beauty of working for the United States uh, government. The public resources that we develop are all free for use. And so we welcome everybody and anybody to come and use them. And I think you answered this question on the chat, but what is the youngest age anyone has ever applied for a patent? I did answer. That's a very common question we get a lot. And unfortunately, we do not track demographic data or age, I don't believe, either on our patent application. So that's a statistic that we just, we, we, it's a number we don't have. There's been stories out there. I think someone claimed that a, th a three-year-old um, was named as a patent and inventor on a patent application, or, or four maybe, I'm not sure. Um, but the one thing I can tell you is there is no age limit to file for a patent. Thank you. So someone felt like we were jumping a bit too much on the site. 
and they want us to go through a click through in order to go from start to finish for for an activity if that's possible can you can you show us a mission for example sure well i'm saying sure david <laughs> <laughs> so i'm trying to understand what's being requested so we'll go to is it an activity or um a series a learning series uh, so actually, have... David, before we do this, can we pop back? I'm sorry. Can we pop back to that last slide? I don't want I don't want to lose people, but um, if sure. you have the time, please fill out this short survey for you. We value your feedback and we would love to hear from you uh, what you liked, what you didn't like, maybe um, a future potential topic that might we might be able to cover in a webinar. Please take this uh, short survey and um, let us know. Let us know how we um, how we did tonight and, and your thoughts about Equip HQ and um, how we can help you, please feel free. So we're going to put the link in the chat. You can use the QR code here as well. And then after this, David, well, you can give it a couple seconds and then we'll jump back over and, and we'll do that walkthrough. Sure. But thank okay. you. Thank you, everybody. Is that going in the chat? Lennon, do you have that one? Yeah, I've already put it on the chat. All right, great. Thanks. Give folks some time. And drop that link as well. Oh, it's in there. Your feedback. Great. All right, David, I think we're good. OK, so was it going on a mission or just going to one activity and going all the way through? And I'm not sure which one. E either one should suffice. I think the mission just... would be nice because you could go through the activity as well. OK. So Mission Equip is designed for those who visit without, say, a teacher's guidance, that some kids are going to come in and they're going to, just going to want to do this. Somebody actually asked in the chat, can a child do um, an activity that's made that's meant for an older child? Absolutely. Um, go ahead, go for it, because it is all here. If you had somebody say, in, if I had somebody in my class who was already finishing with what I was teaching and was doing really well with it, and I wanted more challenge for them, I could put them into a mission equipped, which is sort of like a little mini unit, a guided unit for the child. They'll have to do some independent reading. They can watch these introductory videos, and those should help them along and they can get into the activities. There's a timeline activity there. We saw that one already, so I'll see what else we have here. Some more videos, uh, instructional videos about different types of patents. We can go into the promo zone where you learn to promote what you created. So I can go through a list of optional items that I'd like to promote. I can have the uh, Equip HQ choose my item or I can make one up of my own. I think I will just have it choose for me just because I want to do this quick. So we can do a video storyboard or a full page ad. I guess I'm, um, well, I'm going to go for the full page ad because I love to draw. And so when I get here, I have uh, drawing tools available to me. I can, I can create a drawing. I can um, start to um, make something. I don't know. I, I'm going to have to be really fast here. I'm going to make the super shoe, get the springs in the bottom that I've been thinking about selling. <laughs> you took my with idea. Color. I'm going I'm <laughs> to file <are> not, first. <laughs> these are not unfamiliar tools. You've seen these before. You can do color fill. Um, there's a uh, text you can put words on for your super shoe. Get in there. There's Change different the font layers. Size, which I always have to think about. Change your font size, David. Change your font size. Whoops. Oh, well. It's now called a soup <laughs> That's a great name. It's very fanciful. <laughs> this might actually be better <laughs> for trademarking purposes. This could be better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, and there are layers here. If you want to go back and make some um, fixes in one area or you just don't like what ended up in that. I don't like that name soup shoeer. I'd like it to go away. I'm going to get rid of it. and I'm going to try that again. But I do kind of like soup shoeer. And uh, let's see, what was the other part there? If I can go back, I'm done with that part. Whoops, sorry. Undo, redo, panel editor. There's also stickers on there. Also stickers, I'm trying to get to that part. Sorry, I haven't played this one that often. Select a type, shape, or sticker on your canvas to... Oh, okay, I'm working on that. Stickers are over here, I could add some Interesting, I could add punctuation, signs and symbols. Maybe I want uh, to think about something that this shoe will be for springing over trains. No. 
Oh, I just I just made a mistake in the background. So sorry about that, folks. Wish I was a little better at this. No, no worries. This, but this is this is the fun of the site, right? So there's so many different things to do. This particular one is more geared towards marketing and branding, right? And so, um, actually, we do have the. Um, this one's actually more for marketing. And then you have actually the trademark zone, which you can create an actual, have your students create trademarks. So if they have invention projects, they're building them. You can have them come on Equip HQ and, and build out a, a trademark. Um, and a watch. you can watch the video and it shows you what the different types of trademarks are and what the best kind of um, create, creating tips for creating strong marks. And um, so, yeah, so it's fun. It's, it's really fun. So that's just one activity. Um, there's two more segments. So you got the design and the inspire. Um, and so this, you know, takes you through. There's videos at the end, in the beginning and at the end, so that you see different inventors from different backgrounds. Um, after the, watching the video, it gives educators some prompts to ask students uh, about when, after watching the video um, to solicit some conversation in the classroom. You actually show the did you knows. If uh, up in the corner here, we have a changing set of facts. So every time you go to the site, you will most likely see a new fact. In 1821, Thomas L. Jennings became the first black inventor to receive a patent. If we want to learn more, we can go to that one and we'll get a little more information that goes along with that. What his patent was for, when it was, uh, what happened to it during the patent office fire of 1836. Many were not recovered, unfortunately, after that. And for the K-2 age range, we do have did you know facts, but those are, um, we have those voiced over so that um, if the reading levels aren't quite there yet, you know, they, they can still experience the knowledge and growth from that did you know fact. Design patents protect the way an invention looks. Design patents have the letter D at the beginning of the patent number. So there's a little reading assistance along the way as well. And there's a nice uh, picture from a real patent. And and there's no really rhyme or reason to the did you know facts. They're just meant to be fun, random facts that may or may not help help you along the way. But they're just cool to know, you know, so. All right. So I'll go back to that closing slide again. And so, Marnie, uh, did we, I know you said we didn't have to show every function. Um, did that provide a little more um, insight into the, the flow? So there's that, there's that guided lesson path that students can take. We have the lesson plans that Reggie, um, I think, showed how to get to. And those lesson plans can be found on the, the educators, the parents and teachers page. And um, then there's the different activities. You can just go to an activity, open it up, and start playing around with it if you want, or just go to a video and play a video. Um, this is this can be facilitated, or it can be an unfacilitated free play opportunity for students. It just all depends on the amount of time you have or um, how creative you want to get with um, bringing these into your classroom. Any other questions? Feel free to unmute. We are. Um, at this point, you know, thank you for for attending. Um, how long did it take to develop this from idea stage to final product? Oof, Carla, that's a great question. So, this um, this contract was awarded in September of twenty twenty one. September thirty, we started. October one, we started, and it went live last November. We did a soft launch. So, if if you happen to be at some of our programs or I don't know, you may have stumbled upon this site previously, but we are now officially launching it to the public and you're going to see this in a lot of our um, social media um, uh, posts and as well as conferences that we're going to attend in the spring and summer. Um, we are going to be promoting Equip HQ Heavy. And so please help us share this with your colleagues and um, within your 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 networks, this is not only for educators, it's for parents um, and homeschooled children as well and for everybody. It really is. Um, so. <laughs> the cost, uh, a lot of money. <laughs> I don't get into the finances, I just manage the day to day.
And so we do collaborate, Nicole. Uh, if you would like to um, reach out to us, education at USPTO.gov, we definitely are open to um, ideas for collaboration. If you have ideas on things that can be done for new and innovative ways to bring intellectual property and invention in the classroom. And we also do teacher professional development as well. And so a lot of the um, a lot of the guest speakers we've had on in the past have been um, alumni of some of our uh, intellectual property professional development workshops and programs. And so um, we do welcome we do welcome in invitations to come to your school to do a PD or to your um, district, your school district. Right. And so uh, just fill out the speaker request form. We can also work with your students as well. It just all depends on resources, bandwidth and timing for our team. Right. Thank you, David, for this awesome, awesome presentation. Um, it was fun presenting with you, and I look forward to developing many more intellectual property-based uh, online activities with you and your team. Looking forward to working Thanks to with everyone. You <laughs> if anyone um, out there, if you have a direct question about um, anything, you can send to me as well. I, I do definitely, I encourage you to write to uh, the, the email address that Juan has been sharing with you tonight, uh, education at USPTO. But if you have a direct question about, say, um, implementation, lesson planning, et cetera, uh, go ahead and send me a line. Love to talk to other educators. And thank you. Thanks for coming. Excellent. Well, please fill out the survey if you haven't already. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Be safe out there and please join us on March 28th uh, to hear from Lucy Howell from the Henry Ford Museum. Thanks a lot and have a good evening.